The nature of this hearings, we are not a court. It is not a court proceedings. We are a, municipal, we are a tribunal appointed in terms of the Municipal Property Rights Act. So our processes and procedures are fairly informal, but given the background of the chairperson, he prefers to follow what has been set out by the court in terms of following the rules of natural justice, in terms of hearing evidence, and then afterwards making a decision based upon the decision that has been put before uh, the board. Our decision is final, so if any of the parties might feel aggrieved by the decision, they will then have to take the decision under review in terms of the uh, Pia Act. So he's basically saying we have to go through the Pia Act. What, 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 why do we have to go through the Pia Act? We don't have to go through the Pia Act. Pia has got nothing to do with any of this. Pia is about access to information. This is about review, which would be on the basis of the Promotion of Administration of Justice Act. So he's messed it up. We need to refer to the decision of the board on the 10th of February 2020. That was a board that was constituted differently from, from this one because that was under the previous appointment by the Minister uh, for Local Government. Since then, that board has been replaced by this specific board. But in that instance, the board heard evidence. And the board heard evidence from, as it is, Mr. Jephthah, who was also the municipal value at that stage, as well as Mrs. Phillips and her team regarding the valuation. My attorney put the city on notice that I was going to sue for damages. And on the 21st of October 2019, we got a letter from Ryan Rudolph, um, Finance Treasury Department. But the letter was signed by D. Valentine, who apparently was the Director of Treasury. Valentine states that the institution of legal proceedings against organs of state, including municipalities, is regulated by the institution of legal proceedings against certain organs of state Act, number 40 of 2002 here and after referred to the Act. In terms of Section 3 of the Act, you have six months to serve the municipality with notice of intention to institute legal action in any of the above mentioned courts from the date the debt became due. Should you wish to pursue your right to compensation in court, you are advised that you must comply with the requirements set out in Sections 3 and 4 of the Act. Can you explain, I don't understand this D. Valentine thing about organ of state and municipality, I don't understand it, what does it mean? It means that if you sue the municipality, for example, you need to give them six months notice before you issue the summons against them. You cannot just give them a week or two weeks or one month, you need to give them six months notice in your letter of demand. And, and did you do that in our case? We did that. Mr. Valentine also informed my attorney. At the outset, it must be noted that as an authority entrusted with the administration of public funds, council is precluded from effecting compensation in instances other than where it has been found to be legally liable, such as when negligence has been found to have obtained on the part of council or any of its employees. That's not what the City of Cape Town attorney Ron Pashka said in court. Let's remind ourselves what he said in the damages summons. One year and one month after City of Cape Town Director of Finance Valentine's letter, nine months after my GV 2018 SVO1 10th of February 2020 VAB hearing, and six months after I had served the City of Cape Town my damages summons on the 26th of May 2020. And section 23 remains an operative exemption from liability, which is a complete answer to the totality of the claims by the plaintiff against the city of the municipality in carrying out its functions under the Building Act, um, which take precedence of, of over the, the general provisions of the State Liability Act. And lastly, the fifth point that um, the Building Act, the 1977 Act, is a later act 
and combining it with skill in concrete provision in the earlier act. So for all those reasons, the reliance on the State Liability Act is simply wrong in law. And Section 23 remains an operative exemption from liability, which is a complete answer to the totality of the claims by the plaintiff against the city in this case. Yes. And so if, if that is so, um, um, could that not be pleaded? Could, could, so it could be pleaded by the plaintiff? By the defendant, by the second defendant. Um, so in other words, in response to the allegations in the particulars of claim, um, uh, should the second defendant or could the second defendant not simply plead that um, uh, liability is um, excluded in terms of the, the relevant legislation, the Building Act, for well, example? Well, that, that would still result in the, um, the, <coughs> if the... If the exception is good, that, that the um, Section 23 exempts the city from liability, yes. then um, the whole point of, a, of an exception is to avoid the, the need for the leading evidence of the city being dragged into a trial to deal with all the issues of quantum and uh, negligence and liability when there's a there's a there's a legal defence. If that legal defence is a good legal defence, then, then that is the end of plaintiff's case against the city. What they're saying in terms of Section 23 is that they're immune from liability in the context of building development. So when they give permissions for developers to build buildings, their consent, they can never be sued for that. They are simply not liable. But basically, okay, me as a neighbor, I have no idea what they're building, what they're doing. So a development happens next to me. There is no nothing on the outside of the building site saying that the city of Cape Town are devoid of any liability. So w what does that mean as a neighbour? I mean, does that mean that, uh, why do I have to go to the city and complain to the building inspector? Well, that obviously is an anomaly. Why would they even have a building inspector if they weren't in some way or another responsible for what went on? But in terms of Section 23, if they've got a get out clause or never being liable. So basically we could all sink into a hole with all these building sites around us and the city, the building inspector who's supposed to make sure people build to an approved plan, it doesn't matter because they are literally, they are devoid of any liability whatsoever. They can wash their hands of the whole thing. Just going back now to Mr. Valentine's October 2019 letter. He states, please be advised that the following an investigation into your client's claim, the report received from our spatial planning department revealed that no evidence of unauthorised or unlawful construction work could be detected at the neighbouring property as alleged. There are two defendants in my damages summons and Mr Hoffmeyer is the attorney who represents my neighbour, Mr Stuart Bradbury, who has built illegally, unlawfully into my property damaging my property and has removed lateral support. Three months after the hearing, for some inexplicable reason, he sent me a PDF um, of the engineer drawings, foundation layout and ground floor layout and some meaningless section um, of a Terraforce gravity retaining wall. If my engineer had sight of these drawings before the February VAB hearing um, in 2020, I would never have launched the damages summons in the way I did. And if I had seen these drawings in 2010 and 2012 and 2013, when they were being submitted to the city of Cape Town, I would never have launched my application to set the plans aside in terms of a private agreement. I mean, th th this is just criminal and to expose how despicable and corrupt the city of Cape Town are. A mere four days after the Hofmeyer letter, I then get a letter from Deirdre Oliver, who is the city of Cape Town attorney, who informs me that in fact a building plan was approved in 2018. I had no idea it had been approved. 
and that he's got a contravention notice for another contravention, which is the lack of a balustrade on his, um, they're saying, balcony, but it's actually on the ground floor roof. Now, these are all structures that were subject to my High Court matter, 155702013, where Honourable Judge Bozalak had walked onto a site at a court site inspection and was categorically assured by both the City of Cape Town and First Defendant Mr Bradbury that all structures had been built to a 2012 plan. That's perjury. I, I cannot understand how the city can defend such criminality. And all communication I have with the valuation department, Martin Kutsi, has to go through him as Shahida Samodian Azad. She's the head of communications and valuation disputes. And oh, look at this. She works for the finance directorate. You tell me she doesn't know what's going on? The board was not aware that this is a matter that has been dragging since 2010. The board certainly did not know that at that stage. Chair Kutsi's statement is not credible. He's not telling the truth. On the 7th of January 2020, one month before my 10th of February hearing, I asked him to look at a YouTube film. I went into incredible detail of the fraud and corruption in this email, even giving him the Corruption Act references. I also sent this email to Valuation Appeals, um, who basically is Shahida Samodian Azad. If I had any idea she worked for the city of Cape Town, I never, ever would have involved her in my emails. I cc'd this email to Daniel Plato, um, who had met with me and my attorney on the 31st of May 2019. He promised an independent attorney would look into the matter and investigate. This never happened. And in fact, he ignored every single one of my emails after the meeting. I sent it to the leader of the DA's office. I sent it to my DA ward councillor, Nicola Jow sent it to my attorney and also to Ryan Rudolph from uh, the Treasury and also Helen Ziller. Uh, and in fact, I'd been assured by Miss Ziller that she had spoken to excellent individuals who assured her there was no fraud in my matter. Within the body of the email was a YouTube link to a film I made, which was one hour and eight minutes long. It went into infinite detail of the fraud of the illegal building works. I expressly said if Chair could see could not see the film prior to the hearing, I would be insisting that we watched it during the hearing. Um, the film actually ended with a letter from Helen Zilla, um, which stated that she had been in touch with the city and had been assured that there was no a fraud in my matter, um, you know, according to excellent individuals that she'd spoken to. But she was refusing to tell me who the excellent individuals were were. My 7th of January 2020 email continued. I explained to the Chair Kutsi that the High Court application where the neighbour and the city under oath had said my neighbour built to approved 2012 drawings when he hadn't, that they were lying under oath and they were giving contravention notices for structures that they'd said under oath had been built to an approved plan. They'd excavated five metres you know, and into my property and to the abutting property. I reasonably requested that the, the VAB hearing an independent engineer not affiliated to the city could liaise with my engineer, referring to his reports that were endorsed by a second engineer, a town planner and a Santam insurance um, loss adjuster. The city didn't send anybody to the hearing as I'd reasonably requested. The only person that tipped up was Angela Jepper the valuer um, and which is why my engineer brought all of his evidence uh, but he would only answer questions because nobody at the hearing was a qualified civil engineer. My 10th of February 2020 VAB hearing decision came out on the 28th of April 2020. Bullet point 16 clearly states 
In light of the aforementioned, it was the board's unanimous decision not to confirm, revoke or amend the valuer's decision, but to direct that the 2015 GV valuation should remain in place until such time as to when the above-mentioned concerns have been addressed or 30th of November 2020, whichever date occurs first. We were in the middle of COVID and I had to adhere to the Disaster Management Act. So I decided to organise a site inspection of my property and to give the city enough time. I'd already got a quantity surveyors report and I was ready for them to do a site inspection of my property so that we could all adhere to the Disaster Management Act um, as there would be a number of people attending my property to do a site inspection. On the 21st of October 2020, I wrote to Louise Mullows, Head of Valuations, and I also see seed in Ian Nielsen, um, who was then Deputy Mayor, who had control of the finances of the Valuation Department. I also copied in um, the City Attorney, Deirdre Oliver. I had to inform them in this email that it was now the 21st of October, a month away from the deadline given by the Valuation Appeal Board, in my bullet point five, I state, Angelo Jephtha is visiting properties in the area as he has visited my opposite neighbour, Ray Van Geems, Earth 59, and returning her emails. He has, however, for the record, not returned my emails, but clearly working in the area, so this should not be a problem. Miss Muller, please, as the director of your department, respond to this reasonable and desperate plea to uphold the VAB judgment for the sake of my property. Angela Jephtha can meet at my property with my experts, engineer Mr Whitaker, Sandam, I meant Sandam, insurance Mr Orens, with the city attorneys, engineers, building inspectorate, where said site inspection of my property can be recorded by both parties for the record. Deirdre Oliver ignored my emails and instead, unknown to me, I only found this out on the 7th of um, April 2022, two years later, that she had written to a Mr Muffet, civil engineer, on the 5th of November 2020, giving him a brief. Why did she not send this engineer, who is totally independent from the city of Cape Town, why did she not send him to my property as I requested on the 21st of October 2020? You know, I didn't have to only adhere to the uh, Disaster Management Act, but I had to prepare my property. Some of the cracks in my property need scaffolding, you know, to go and analyse. You can't just say, take a photograph. You know, there are many structural cracks on my property. Um, I, I, I don't understand Deirdre Oliver's modus operandi. I don't, other than it is devious. Um, I, I can't think of any other explanation. Why? But it's, I know you don't yeah, think I'm it's important, sir, but I'm just telling you why. Yeah, I understand that. Uh, it, what it's... I wanted to find out from Mr. Jeff does, would a second inspection change your uh, proposal? Uh, thank you, Chair. Chair, a second inspection and knowing, and obviously with the first inspection we do evaluation inspection, a second inspection would be, um, must be done by an engineer. Chair Kutzi's. 20th of June 2022 decision, paragraph 26. He states, the city of Cape Town also attempted to arrange for a site visit, but the appellant refused such request. Once more, Chair Kutsi's statement is not credible. I also have seen uh, some information and documentation amongst other decision by uh, Judge Napier in a matter. It's not Napier. It's Mr. Justice Papier. In Chair Kudzi's 20th of June 2022 decision, he once more carried the wrong name, Judge Napier. Chair Kudzi's attention to detail is sorely lacking. In fact, his whole judgment is riddled with errors, just like his first judgment was on the 28th of April 2020. Advocate Chair Kudzi is not detailed enough to be chair of a valuation appeal board when people's livelihoods and whether they can afford to put food on their table depends on it. 
We you made the remark that the Valuation Appeal Board doesn't have the powers to make a valuation determination. I would respectfully disagree with the Honourable Judge. This Board certainly do have the powers to determine a valuation. For the simple reason, whenever it is clear from the evidence that the evidence is defective or there's other reasons, the Board, simply because of its composition being comprising of no less than three professional values, is fully entitled to make a valuation determination. Yeah.